Okay, good morning, conference. How are you? Are you there? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me at the back? Can you see me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. All right. So can we all stand up, please? Very, you've got a very obedient audience this morning, a very obedient audience. Okay, so we're going to try a Mexican wave. Okay, so we're going to start over there, come to here, and then go back to there and round again. So are you ready? It goes like this. Start over here. Okay, ready. Okay, back, forward, the front, now the front, now, now the front, now the back, now the back, now the front, now the back. Now the front. Okay, keep going. Okay, turn around and wave to the back. Uh, deep breath and you can sit. Thank you so much. You're such an obedient audience. Uh, okay. Can I bring you to every event on earth? <laughs> so I'm Dilly Salmon. It is my pleasure to bring you the panel this morning where our theme is pushing the boundaries, the techno technological boundaries and other sorts of boundaries as well. Um, so you can read about them in the booklet, but I'm not going to waste any time to get them absolutely going. So we're going to start with Shirley Alexander and then Brian Alexander. As you can see, Shirley and Brian are identical twins. <laughs> You'll have difficulty in spotting the difference. In fact, they didn't meet until this week. <laughs> um, and then we're moving to Laura. So are you ready for this? And we're going to leave a bit of time at the end to have a conversation with you. So. You know, start making your notes and making your Twitter comments and uh, we'll try and make sure there's a chance for you to interact with them. Okay, so it's over to you, Shirley. Shirley Alexander is uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President Education Students at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Over to you, Shirley. So thank you very much for the invitation to come to Germany. Um, while you get used to my accent, I'll just tell you that the first time I spoke in Germany was about 25 years ago, and I got about 10 minutes into my presentation, and some very helpful person raised his hand in the audience and asked me whether I was aware that this is an English-speaking conference. <laughs> and um, I was a bit horrified by that, but. I, I, um, I think Australians tend to be um, to speak very quickly, and so if I do that, I'd really appreciate it if you put your hand up, if you can't understand what I'm saying. So I've been working in educational technology and higher education for a long time, and I've never been one to think that the sky is falling in. Um, when there was a big rush of excitement, when the internet became more prevalent and people were saying this is the end of universities. I said, no, it's not. When multimedia came in, MOOCs came in. I think my university is the only one that hasn't doubled in MOOCs because I don't see it as being the future. But I do think we are at a tipping point in higher education, but not for the reasons that you might think. I don't think the robots are coming for our jobs. But I do think there are some changes on the horizon that are going to have a significant impact on the way that we do our work. And I've only got 20 minutes this morning. I'd like to talk about many things, but I just had to pick two. So the first one is the rising cost of education. I just can't see it being sustainable, which is why I'm going to be saying that I think we should be taking the reins and deciding how we're going to use technology to push the boundaries of higher education to make it more sustainable. 
And I then want to talk about graduate employability. So in terms of student debt in Australia, the total student debt is $61 billion. And of that, a quarter will not be repaid. And 18,000 people have debts greater than $100,000. And if you look at the way that cost has been changing over the last couple of years, you don't have to be a statistician to extrapolate that graph. Um, it's not so different in the US where student, student debt tops $1.6 billion and not too different in the UK. In fact, what I found really interesting when I was in the US recently, I was told that if you're declared bankrupt in the US, all your debts are erased except for your student loans. So they stay with you for your whole life. So something has to give because student debt just keeps on growing. So this, if we just do one thing, what we have to do is look at how we can use technology to reduce the cost of education. Now, I did a little exercise a couple of years ago, which I didn't have time to show you today, where I went back and looked at all the promises that have been made about technology over the years, and the only thing that's really changed was the year and the technology. I didn't do it because I knew Audrey Waters was speaking, and she's done a much better job than I have of that, but as um, the more things change, the more the claims stay exactly the same. So I'm just going to talk about, uh, give you a bit of context about what I'm actually doing to try and address this issue of the cost. Now, my university has been through a major campus redevelopment, and there's some of the buildings that have been constructed. The one on the top right was designed by Frank Geary and has been nicknamed our, paper our brown paper bag, a crumpled brown paper bag. Um, and we've spent 1.5 billion Australian dollars. Just, I've just um, converted it to some other currencies so you can get a sense of the size of it. Now what's important to me is not what the buildings look like, that's what everybody else is excited about, but what's important to me is what's going on inside the buildings. So this was an article in um, Campus Review, which is a national higher education magazine, and they talked about the fact that this academic had turned up to give a lecture and not a single student turned up. And the reason for that was he recorded his lectures. So the students were saying, why should I turn up if I can just watch it online? And this was actually my starting point in thinking about how we design a campus for the future. And I think it was, this is borrowing from Seymour Papert, any lecture that can be replaced by a recording should be. And if you look at graphs at my institution before we embarked on this of attendance rates in different kinds of classes, you can see that lectures are not terribly popular. So I had to come up with a strategy to ensure that the money that we're spending on our campus was going to be worth the investment. And this is the strategy that we have been using um, for the past six, seven years. So we know, and it's really focused on what do students need to do in order to learn. Now that's a big shift for a lot of academics who want to talk about in terms of how they teach. So getting them to stop and think about what do students need to do in order to learn is a big challenge. So the students come in with learning goals. Now they need to access ideas and content. And there's a myriad of ways for students to do that now. Then once they're on campus, what we want them to be engaged in is active learning, where they have conversations with other students, where they're collaborating with other students and where they're, they're developing capabilities in communication and teamwork alongside the learning in their discipline area. But then 
what often happens is students have, get to a loose collection of ideas and they need to do something to create meaning. And so they need activities that help them make sense. Feedback is absolutely critical. There's action without feedback. Who remembers writing an essay in high school or university and you have it returned with a tick and eight out of 10 and you have no idea how you would have got 10 or why you didn't get five. So feedback is a really critical part of that and then opportunities to reflect on what you understood, what you did, what the feedback was and so on. Now, one of the things that we do, and I'm sure you do it at many universities, is we really over-survey our students. We ask them to fill out a survey at the end of every subject or course. We ask them about overall satisfaction, IT, library, everything. But one of the things that I do, and I, I dedicate a couple of entire weekends to do this, is I actually sit down and I read through all the qualitative comments that students make about what they like and what they don't like. And being a, a lap statistician, I can't help but code what those things are. It really gives me a good sense of how students are experiencing university. And who wants to guess what the number one thing that they value is from my reading of magazines? It's the teacher. They, I, um, there was one particular comment that stood out for me and it said, um, I'd rather be taught by Einstein in a tent than Dumbo in the entertainment machine. And um, students really value high quality engagement with people, with other students and with teachers. So we've devised a whole range of strategies under the making sense and testing ideas for what students how we should be designing learning for students. And there's just a couple of examples of what they're doing. So we've just opened um, a brand new building. And so I've put myself on the, on the design committee for every single one of our new buildings because I don't actually care what the outside looks like, but other people really like the outside. I care about what's on the inside. And so we've got, so what I'm trying to look at is how we can reduce the cost of education by clever design of learning at scale. So this is what would once have been called a large lecture theatre. And it's what we call a large collaborative theatre. Now what's unique and different about this is that there is no front of the room. I couldn't do what I'm doing now, even if I wanted to. Well, I could if... Um, I could at a pinch, but it's, it's been designed to design out lectures. And the reason we did that is we looked at a lot of other collaborative, large collaborative theatres around the world and looked at how they were being used. People were still giving lectures in them. So we designed that out. I'm just going to show you a couple of images of what it looks like with students in it. So hopefully you can see it looks completely unlike the lecture theatres that I certainly grew up in. So that's the context of, of working. But as I mentioned, what are we going to do about the cost issue? So what I've been working on with my team is, is there a way in which we can use analytics? To, to reduce the cost of education. And the first example I'm going to show you is giving instant, students instant feedback on academic writing. So there's a lot in around at the moment about learning analytics and there's a whole journal devoted to it. But my concern is that we are looking at little incremental changes in higher education rather than going for the big issues. And there's some interesting work. Uh, gamification had resulted in better communication between students, better quality, and so on. Um, another paper 
personality traits, good, good predictor of outcomes, but not until 75% of the way through the course. So a bit late to do much. There's a lot of work on prediction, but I think, um, and this was a really interesting one and clearly needs a lot more work, I think, no significant difference in outcomes between student-focused designs and teacher-focused. So, um, we've been working on academic writing analytics. Now, why did we choose to use analytics for this? Well, this is um, a student journey map that I'm not expecting you to be able to read, of course. Um, this is where we looked at um, what students say about different aspects of their journey. And students always, and I see this all the time in the comments, always complain about the quality of the feedback that they're getting. So that's one reason. Second reason is I used to sit on, on panels when we were interviewing academics for um, jobs, and I'd always ask them, what do you like the least about being a teacher, and nine out of 10 people said marking. Academics don't like doing marking. So we've got a major problem there. Academics don't like doing it and students want more of it. So my team, and I just want to acknowledge this is not my work, but this is the work of four of my colleagues and some of them may be well known to you. And what they've done is developed a program that uses analytics to give students automated feedback on writing. So the idea is that students can submit their piece of writing to this program as many times as they need to until it, they've got a coherent structure. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in other countries, but in Australia we find the writing skills of students coming in from high school still needs a lot of work. And so what this does is it enables the students to get feedback on the structure and whether they've made a good argument. Once they're happy with it, it then goes to the academic for marking on the academic content. So the academic doesn't have to spend time on making suggestions about arguments missing and so on. And this is... Um, about reflective writing. So there is a, um, an assessment rubric and then there are markers which are important aspects of reflective writing. Initial thoughts, the challenge, new knowledge can lead to change. And so the piece of writing is marked up with those markers. I'm going to give you links to these at the end, so you can go straight to the website and get all of this. And then they'll get a summary that you have acknowledged your thoughts, you have reflected on how you would change, but you don't seem to have reported on what you found challenging. Perhaps you've only reflected on what's positive. So it's giving students some key ideas um, about what they need to look at. So that's reflective writing. We've also looked at the kind of writing which is designed to be persuasive and argumentative. And we've done a lot of this in, in the Faculty of Law. And the basis of this is what they call rhetorical moves, a clear signal to what the purpose of a sentence is. Just a couple of examples there. So it's signalling to the readers that we're working with ideas and they're the kind of, of rhetorical moves that this program is looking for and some examples. And this again is a summary feedback that someone in civil law might receive. So how has this gone? Well, students almost, I really don't like these kinds of evaluations where you ask students whether they like something because they almost always like something that's different. Um, but here are some of the comments that students made.
And what the teachers say, they don't have the time to give the kind of formative feedback when they've got 400 students. And, and the teachers, this is all anecdotal of course, saying that they've seen a marked improvement in students' written communication. So that's one example. And my second and final example of analytics is personalised feedback. Now we have large classes. And so what we're trying to do is find ways that we can give students some individual feedback on how they're going. So this is a project the team developed. It's essentially just using a mail merge technology to send students individual feedback. And here's an example in the business school where data is taken from a number of places and then um, it's, it's given a condition, one, two, three or four, and then that's what the feedback message is to each of them. Now the first time um, Jürgen Schulter used this, his students genuinely thought he had sent an email, personal email to 900 students. As you can see, what's, um, what is being added in the mail merge program is there in red and differs between students. So the use of analytics is just one example of what we might do. Um, and I think if we're, I can see that governments are going to be looking at this rising cost of higher education. And if we're not at the table and looking at how we can improve or decrease the cost of education, if we're not at the table, we're going to be on the menu. Now, I, I work in an, um, a senior management job, and even though I was employed in that role because of my knowledge of technologies, I'm constantly having to um, find ways of arguing against the latest panacea that governing boards and governments try to impose on us because they think that MOOCs are going to be the way to educate without the cost or they think um, I had a very senior person try to tell me that I wasn't up with the times because augmented reality is the way that all of education should go in my university. I mean, it's just, uh, is this being recorded? No. <laughs> so bear, bear a thought for people in my kind of role where you're trying to hold back this tide um, of ideas about how ed tech is going to be the solution. You're trying to hold back the tide, but at the same time, try to find what are the really useful ways of using technology to achieve what they're trying to do um, in, in putting forward these. Um, I'm just going to finish with the second one, which is about the issue of graduate employability, which is another challenge that we are applying technology to. Um, so I'm not sure if it's the same in other countries, but we're always having newspaper articles saying that higher education is failing our youth, leaving them overqualified and underemployed. We get articles from people saying my degree was a waste of money. Um, at the same time, we have lots of press about the fact that a number of our large organisations are starting to um, stop and announce that they're not employing graduates anymore, that they don't find that they're useful enough. And they say their transcript, that's what we give a student when they graduate, is completely useless to them. That it just contains a list of subjects and it's of no value. So what one of my colleagues um, has developed um, a program called Review and I'm just going to show you a short video um, of what that does. For a hundred years, educational assessment has been based around a high stakes exam regime. This regime uses a single mark or grade as feedback on students' progress and abilities. While these marks may have served us in the past, 
They are now seen as too simplistic a measure of student progress and ability. They tell us nothing about the capabilities evident in a student's work or their performance over time. They ignore the vast overlap between subjects. They wipe out individuality, encourage rote learning, and, alarmingly, can even lead to stress, depression, and suicide. There is now widespread agreement among leading educators that this needs to change. And change is in the air. Universities have already shifted their focus towards student graduate attributes and capabilities. And now, the Australian National School curriculum requires the development of a range of general capabilities. Alongside numeracy and literacy, there are five others, including creative and critical thinking and ethical understanding. But how will these skills be meaningfully assessed? Review is an innovative software package developed by a Learning Futures Fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney, that offers a welcome alternative to the outdated exam-based regime, designed to measure, record and track a student's progress across multiple subjects and capabilities over time, review adds much needed depth to assessment. Here's how it works. Grading criteria are established and linked to graduate attributes, categories and program learning goals. Using these criteria, students self-assess their work before they hand it in against customizable grading scales. Then, teachers assess the work using the same scale. They can then see each other's assessment through visual markers and comments and both receive progress charts. Review is different because it makes students and teachers equal partners in the learning process. This fosters engagement and self-reflection in students, gives teachers important insights into progress and facilitates a much more satisfying and personalised learning journey. Further down the track, Review offers employers access to a well-rounded profile of an applicant that clearly indicates their qualities and skills. The platform has easy online access, secure hosting and integration, and is completely configurable. The software is being trialled at high schools and some of Australia's leading universities. Review is assessment with real-world relevance. So that was my second and final example. I think one of the most important things about that program is the way that there's a, a system that goes alongside it that tries to help students develop a capacity for self-assessment by making judgments about their own capabilities. Because once they leave university, we're not going to be there anymore to give them that feedback and marks. And so developing that capacity for self-assessment um, is really important. So that's my 20 minutes worth. Um, I hope what I've explained to you is that I think we are at a tipping point in higher education. And it's because the cost of education is rising exponentially. And with an ageing population, governments are going to be looking at ways in which they can reduce the cost to them of providing education. And we can talk at length about how education is in the public good and so it should be funded at the level that we want. But when governments are looking at do we fund education, do we fund aged care, do we fund health care, um, they're going to be looking at ways of saving money so it's better for us to be coming up with big projects that push the boundaries of technology to try to achieve that. For a hundred years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shirley. I, I honestly can't think of a better place than to be doing the pushing on costs and feedback. That must be absolute pinpoint, and I'm sure a lesson for us all on that. So thank you. You will have a chance to ask questions uh, to Shirley in a bit, but we're going to move straight on to Brian Alexander this time. So thank you. So, as you know, Brian's a futurist, so keep moving forward. Um, are you ready, Brian? Yeah, I just don't know which laptop um, this is. There's no laptop here. 
And where's the clicker? You had the clicker. You had the power. Well, that's fantastic. Are you okay? Oh, I'm great. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think I have more hair than any two of you. I was initially going to deliver my speech in a death metal voice, so I could say, good morning, Berlin. But I was afraid that might frighten some of you in the wrong way. So I'll just begin by saying good morning from America. This is uh, our latest invention. This is a robot uh, being tested by the uh, Massachusetts State Police. So I just wanted to give you a little hint of the future as it begins to come closer and closer to you. Now our topic this morning is pushing technological boundaries. And as a futurist, this is exactly the kind of discussion that I love. This is the research that I conduct. And so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can find me on Twitter, of course. I haven't tweeted for three minutes and already I'm getting shaky. Um, and you can find out more from the Future of Education Observatory. But what's next to the technology and education is also the center of my new book, Academia and Next, which ships in a few weeks from Johns Hopkins University Press, just so you know. I mean, just Christmas holidays are coming up, just a little thought, right? But let's think about this topic in a deeper context, which is what futurists do. We've been immersed in technical and ed tech details for the past few days, terrifically, splendidly. But let's rethink that with some perspective. Let's zoom out and think of the big picture. Let's look to the future based on what we can see emerging in the present. Now, education is becoming more international. That's a kind of cliche, but let's think about this for a second. Let's push it a little further. It's becoming more transnational. Uh, we're seeing more, especially in higher education, as capital and as populations move across borders, so does teaching, so does learning, so does research. This map of the European higher education area just gives one powerful example. But let's go a little further, and let's imagine two scenarios about how international education could play out over the next 10 years. So scenario one, I call planetary university. Now imagine a higher education that is globally distributed accessible to students everywhere, producing and sharing research across all borders. There are literally several bricks and mortar planetary universities that you can go to, but at the same time, students can transfer readily across universities and colleges worldwide. Planetary university, in a sense, echoes the movement of money, ideas, and people across borders. Now, scenario two is the opposite. We'll call it National College. That's where higher education's focus is on a given nation. And it has little international focus, little faculty or student engagement across borders. Regulation, accreditation are national or even smaller than that, more hyper-localized. Academic research in this scenario has national party characteristics, celebrates or ignores certain national groups, certain sciences are downplayed or emphasized, the humanities are reshaped accordingly. Now, we've already seen some small signs of this in controversies over the language of instruction, with calls to either teach a global language, i.e. English, or to teach in a local tongue. We've also seen this in the Hungarian government's recent successful expulsion of the international university, which relocated to Vienna. Obviously, this can be driven by nationalist anti-globalization movements, which can, of course, be defined by various forms of right-wing politics. Uh, if the photo in the middle disturbs you, just look for the animated version. Good morning. <laughs> um, the biggest driver of change for all of these may, in fact, be climate change. By the way, if you haven't seen this map, this is one of the most mind-boggling signs of climate change. This is the path across northern Canada, which we used to call the Northwest Passage. And for centuries, hundreds and thousands of people died trying to make that crossing because it was choked with ice. It's open now. You can take a boat from the Atlantic to the Pacific and back and forth easily as you can as the Arctic ice begins to shrink. 
In fact, there's already a kind of geopolitical contest to see over who gets to explore and own the newly opened Arctic seafloor. Now, climate change can push these two scenarios into reality. Now, think about rising sea levels, growing desertification. Think about increasing weather damage to the natural and the human-built environment. And that could create a sense of global urgency, which summons us to species-wide collaborations for research and really urgent learning. Or we could react defensively, drawing in upon ourselves like turtles, with nations and smaller groups seeking instead to focus and protect on what's theirs. Either way, climate change could push either of those scenarios. Now, in the Futurist Toolkit, in many ways, our most reliable tool is demographics, because demographic change is very, very slow. And unless something truly bizarre happens, it's usually locked in place for decades. So one of the powerful things I want you to think about as we think about technology, and as my sister Alexander mentioned in her very last remarks, think about how our population changes. Does anyone here recall back in the 1970s our great fears of overpopulation? Classic film, Soylent Green, right? when we were terrified of too many people, and population has grown since then. But some things have happened in the exact opposite. For right now, I want to focus on the triumph of modernity, its impact on lifespans and birth. Simply put, we now tend to live longer while producing fewer children. Think of this demographic chart as a model of human history until around 1900. Historically, for thousands of years, humans produced tons of babies. As the great writer Neil Stephenson says, we tend to spam the environment with babies. But as you can see from this chart, mortality sets in quickly, and year by year our populations are whittled down until we have very few elders, which is one of the reasons for so many cultures from Confucianism to tribal societies having lots of veneration for seniors, because there are so few of them. Here's Germany. This is what modernity looks like. We take that pyramid and we flip it upside down. We produce fewer children, more middle-aged adults, and more seniors. Here's Japan. You can find similar charts from Mexico, for South Korea, even my country. On the left, you can see that kind of pyramid from 1960. It has a special bulge for baby boomers because baby boomers have everything special. But on the right, you can see where we're headed. I call this the refrigerator diagram, right? Um, this is also, by the way, an official government pop, uh, publication. The one on the right is probably too optimistic because it assumes continued migration to the U.S. We can laugh now, right? But think about it. What does this mean for education? Uh, and by the way, how did this happen? One of the reasons this happened is because medical science improved. Secondly, we have public health, which has gotten better and better. And third, because of you all. We know that the more education women get, the fewer children they have across societies, across continents. So thanks to you, we have this changing demographics. Thank you, just so you know. What does this mean again, though? Now that you've done this, what does it do to you? Well, we now have to retool higher education and education as a whole to really think about lifelong learning, because we live longer. And as speakers have said, we have more demands to reskill or change. For example, if I decide to become a professional photographer, hello, I may study with this gentleman here with his fine hat and his even more fine camera. Or if I want to change and learn a language that's difficult, say Finnish, I'm going to come back to Finland later today, don't worry, then I need to spend time in school. Demographics means the longer we live, the more adult learning we have to have. Think in particular, though, about elders people 60, 65, and older, that may be the largest booming population of citizens taking higher education. Think about them as the center of higher education, and you reimagine universities. But the technological responses are complicated. They're not necessarily more technology is better. As my sister Alexander mentioned, we can get, have all kinds of technologies pushed on us that don't necessarily work. But think about it this way, some seniors will really love to have wonderful new technologies. They'll play with iPads, they'll use keyboards, that's fantastic. 
Some of them will prefer voice interfaces, so they'll work with Alexa. By the way, a great thing to do with Alexa is to ask her if she is Skynet. If you haven't done this, check out the response. It's actually nice uh, and not disturbing. It doesn't trigger World War III or anything. But think as well about other technologies. This is a wonderful project from Toronto where they were trying to reimagine the city because they have more and more seniors, some of whom have cognitive disorders, memory issues, thinking processing issues, and they're trying to reconfigure the city as a result. And one decision they came up with was a good number of seniors don't like iPads. They prefer not digital screens, but buttons and dials that they grew up with. Maybe our technology has to be more complicated than we think. But this, all this demographic change is not happening universally. This is a very, very important map. Basically, anything that gets a lighter color, you think that kind of tan or orange or light green, are places where we are producing fewer children, where the populations will shrink over time. The areas that are blue are the ones that are still producing kids. Look carefully at this map. Look at Europe, North America, South America, Australia, most of Asia, and those are places where the population has plateaued or is starting to shrink. If you want to look at where the human race is still producing children, you have to look at sub-Saharan Africa. You have to look at parts of the Middle East. You have to look at parts of Central Asia. We normally think about India or China being the great children-producing countries. That's already stopped. Think about what this could mean for higher education or education as a whole. Do we have to restructure higher ed to zoom in on the new youth population? Do we have to think about ways of teaching them remotely? Further, what happens to the migrant population? Remember I mentioned climate change. If we have an increasing number of migrants, how do we support them? How do we connect them with education? Now we can think about technology. Now let's zoom in and think about what the digital world changes, how it changes and what it means. We have a lot of different technologies we can talk about. We can talk about virtual reality. We could talk about augmented reality. We could talk about mixed reality, Bitcoin, robotics, data analytics, gaming, 3D printing, the Internet of Things. What does all this mean for you? What does this mean for education? Well, we've been exploring this for several days now, and we will continue to do so today. But let me add a few top-level macro notes as we think ahead. First of all, all these technologies together means the technology environment becomes more complicated. It becomes richer. Think about a student who may come to campus already having 3D printed historical buildings, possibly having artificial intelligence experience with a language program like Duolingo on their phone. Think about an adult learner who comes to you expecting to be able to access spaces through augmented reality or virtual reality. This will just keep expanding and increasing and getting richer and more complicated. Secondly, our pedagogies have to change in response because the technologies do different things. So you think about blended learning, the flipped classroom, that's easy, we're already doing that. We can go still further. Think about pedagogy. Think about student-based pedagogies. Think about students as producers as well as consumers. And alongside this, we also think about the possibility of increased access. Can we reach out to students and give them more access to more, to more learning through these technologies? Or do we reproduce inequalities? So do we, for example, have fantastic teachers in cities, but not in the countryside? Do we have access broken down by religion, by gender, by race? How do we make all that access work? On top of this, open. I don't just mean open source software, which is excellent. I don't just mean open education resources, although that's powerful. I also mean open access to scholarly publication. We may flip to a majority of those in the next six years. Imagine if the typical student on earth has to pay nothing for their material for their classes. Imagine if all of you have access for free to the majority of the human scholarly output. Think about what kind of renaissance we might be on the edge of as a result. There's still more top-level issues. I mean, think about the pressure on learning and professional development. If you want to learn how to use, th this is, by the way, 
uh, one of my classes going through 3D printing. Because I'm in Germany, I can make this comment. Two of my students got very excited by printing and what it meant for education. So, like typical students, they went online and found a 15th century 3D model of an early Gutenberg press. They printed it, about yay big. They printed a screw for it as well. They then made plates using 3D printers and laser cutters, which you could then put ink under and paper, and you could basically print pages out of this, including a book. One of the plates they had looked funny because it was a QR code. And that QR code took you to an augmented reality series of web pages that explained their analyses of printing and education. Pretty marvelous. Kind of terrifying. But they could do all of that. The rural state where I lived for the past 20 years has an annual contest where middle school and high school students, so kids aged 14 to 18, have to go into their community, find a historical building. It could be a fortification, it could be a prison, it could be a department store, and then they have to model it in 3D files and then print out the result. And we have an annual contest where they printed this giant map of the state and the kids put copies of their models on it so we could all be Godzilla and walk around the state and look at these models. But then we had to go to each of their teams and ask them how they produce these things. And if you haven't heard 14-year-olds say, well, yes, I was trying to model the texture of this 18th century building, and the problem was it had two different kinds of stone, so I had to reproduce those before the printout. And then a 15-year-old says, yeah, that was okay, so we did it twice with two different models you could take. All this done without state support, all this done without blazing new technology. Think about those teenagers going to your universities and colleges. Think about them working in your workforce. So, 3D printing is one way we can go with this. Think about the empowerment of students as well. Now, if you're looking at me like that, this clock says I have eight minutes, is that right? Well, it's not right, then I have to show you this excellent photograph. This is a drone with a chainsaw. I have no reason to show this to you. No, no, this is a... When we think about automation, and we think about where automation can go, by the way, this is a Finnish project. I told you I would come back to Finland. Uh, we think about what technology can mean in the form of automation very, very quickly. Upsides, we can have automated tutors. We can have research advancing through automation. We can have augmented creativity, where we use software to help us make films, make images, to make stories. There are downsides that we're already seeing, including automating inequalities. We're seeing possible underemployment or social dislocation, which some speakers have spoken to over the past two days. We may see cuts to academic staff if we can replace tutors or staff with technology. We have to rethink, we have to rethink curricula. We have to rethink institutional structures. And above all, I love this left one. This is a great 21st century image, but think about Education, just for one moment, in terms of automation, you know, you had them do a wave. What I'm seeing is a wave of cameras right now. It's just great, this tidal wave of glimmering uh, plastic. But think about this. As we're confronting automation and what it means for the human race and for society, who is better equipped to help us think it through than academia? Governments? <laughs> no, not very well. Hollywood? They can give you some images, but not much more. Think about theologians, think about legal scholars, sociologists, psychologists, computer scientists. Academia is our best guide forward, and we need to be on that right now. My last thought. Think about all these futures, all these unfolding futures, but they didn't come from anywhere else. This is not a cargo cult. You make this future. You get to make this happen with every decision you make, with every curriculum you support, every class you take, every student you help out. Work on this. Think about this future. You are all practicing futurists. Do so with the flame of creativity roaring in your hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I don't think the timer is right. Um,
if you get ready to do the change over life. So, again, can I please ask you all to stand? It's a bit like being in church, isn't it, really? Yeah. So, what I'd like you to do now is to turn to the person behind you who's been there all this time <laughs> and just have a one-minute conversation, something that you agreed with or disagreed with. I'll let you know when your one minute is up from what you've heard so far. I know, I don't need them. It's not appropriate know, up here. But, but this it's causing a confusion with the, the, time. the, the timing. is causing a confusion it's on the long. numbers. Yeah, it's too long. It should have been 20 minutes. So they're following it, and it's different from yeah, what I'm in. And so that's what they were trying to follow. Okay, so if you can take the, the numbers off, because it's obviously they're looking... Can you leave the numbers? But make it 20 no, minutes. It's well, it's on, tw it's, on tw it's on 30 minutes, you see. It's on 25. Yeah, okay. All right. Can you do that? Yeah, that'd be super. Yeah, for the Q&A later, have a microphone there. Just let me know and I will go to the crowd. If you yes, to yes, we will do that, yeah. Sorry? Was it on 30? Yeah, it was. No, I actually was timing her. I stopped her before the end. And they've changed the numbers all the time. Yeah, yeah. Are you ready then? I'll stop them. Thank you so much. It was super. I'm sorry about that. There was confusion on the numbers they were putting okay, up. I was, I was it's quite by... disturbing, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I was going by what it's they not had. your fault. It's, it's mine. Okay. Yeah, we're not making sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, no. Okay. No, I just... We started 10 minutes late as well, so that caused yeah. the confusion. So. I thought the clock was counting down from 20. I didn't realise it was no. from 25, so yeah. I took the ball. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's not your fault. Okay. We'd like to get going. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hopefully you'll have time uh, to speak to your new friend uh, uh, after this session and after coffee. Just to say, we did start 10 minutes late, so we might just go five minutes into the coffee break. So I understand if anyone needs to rush out at that point, just to make sure that I'm sure you now would like to hear from Laura, who doesn't have the surname Alexander, um, Chernovich from um, South Africa. So I'm over to her for our last exploration of pushing the boundaries and another take on this. Thank you. Over to you, Laura. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, my first OEB. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, my Twitter handle is there and the slides are online. So if there are any references or anything that of interest, you will find them. I want to ask who in this room remembers this report? Put up your hand if you remember this report. About a quarter of you. So this was a report that came out in 2013, and it was a terrifying report. It had a great impact on the lives of many vice chancellors. An avalanche is coming. This new technology, an avalanche, is going to crush humans, kill humans perhaps. A very powerful image of humanity at the mercy of the technical. And we've seen this discourse continue through many books and articles of technology as an unstoppable force, widespread and inevitable, the cause of social change. That's the, that's the strong message that we've been receiving. What I'm arguing today is that at the moment, we are at a critical moment. Shirley spoke about a turning point. I am suggesting that this is a confluence at the moment of digitization, marketization, and datification, all three at the same time. And of course, this is all happening at the same time as state funding's being reduced, 
the student body generally is becoming more diverse, inequality is growing even as technology grows, and curriculum change is happening both in terms of how and what. So it's quite a powerful moment, but there's this confluence happening. In terms of marketization, Ball and Udell spoke more than a decade ago about exogenous marketization, where higher education becomes a business opportunity. There was a really interesting article recently about how UK universities in England and Wales are now competing over a record amount of competitive revenue, making them some of the biggest businesses in the UK. According to that graph, they are the biggest businesses in England and Wales. And we've seen, according to our speaker's research yesterday, that investment, global investment in edtech was 4.46 billion last year. So we've got an interesting moment where there are new forms of market making, what Komljanovic describes very well in her work as market making. And with that, there is the rise of unbundled services through an extraordinary number of ed tech companies. So this is a 2017 uh, landscape uh, image that shows all the, um, the companies that are available through the student life cycle. I couldn't afford the 2019 report, it was too expensive. But it's interesting if you look, for example, at the online program managers, there were about 12 in 2017. At my last count, there are about 60. So this is an exploding area. The other interesting thing about marketization is what, uh, was what's called endogenous marketization, and that is where universities become like businesses themselves. So the platform economy, the platform infrastructure, which links consumers and sellers directly, is now infiltrating into the notion of a platform university. And this was a recent conference held in Dublin where one of the university speakers was actually talking about creating the Amazon of higher education. This has become a, a real aspiration. I'm sure pretty much everyone in this room knows this book. I don't know how many have read it. It's very fat. But I reckon this is one of the most seminal books of our times, along with Piketty's Inequality, uh, Castells' Network Society, um, Zuboff's Age of Surveillance Capitalism. If you don't manage to read the book, you can always go to Brian Alexander's Thursday Night Sessions because he's done great summaries of it for the rest of us. Um, and a couple of people have commented. So the brilliant uh, historian, Akil Mbembe, says our mind and psychic life have become the main raw material with digital capitalism which it, digital capitalism aims to capture and commodify. And the wonderful writer Zadie Smith says there's effectively no choice. Basically, you click yes, because you're not going to read everything. You click yes, and once you've done that, you're submitting to a system which makes your life, it's manifestly unfree, and it steals data from you every moment. And Zuboff, in one sentence, says that this is actually an economic logic which predicts and not only predicts, modifies human behavior as a means to produce revenue and market control. Modifies, I think that's the critical thing. <clears throat> and if you haven't watched um, The Great Hack on Netflix, it's a brilliant exemplification of how this was actually done during the Trump and Brexit elections. And we're starting to see evidence of this in um, education. So, the and this is no um, criticism of the individuals from this particular company over here, but this particular logic is um, students' work being given to a company and sold back to universities. And then another example where students who go on websites to investigate a university are, are tracked and then given individualized responses if they're the kind of student the university wants. So I think we're at a moment of extreme danger with a dominant technological determinist discourse, with profit making determining the higher education agenda and surveillance capitalism infiltrating higher education. So what is to be done? 
especially for those of us who really believe in the sustainable development goals, who believe in ensuring inclusive and quality education for all and promoting lifelong learning, who believe in education as a public good. What is to be done? And I'm going to take a little ad break here before trying to answer that question. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment. See how camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. So it's hilarious. It's hard to imagine that so recently smoking was so ubiquitous. In this hall, in the planes and trains that we came to get here, in the restaurants, in the classroom, it was normal. And now it's impossible to imagine. And there's a long history of tobacco companies fighting very hard for the evidence around tobacco and the public health and the cancerous effects it had um, becoming known. So I'm going to suggest, perhaps controversially, that the big tech companies are the new tobacco companies. And I'm going to say, I'm going to ask, Will future generations ask us, why didn't you do something about it? And this is the moment where I want to share with you some of my thinking about facing my despair at this dystopia. Because this is the dominant narrative. And it's a scary narrative. And I want to believe that the new normal is not inevitable, that it's possible to create a counter-narrative. And I looked long and hard to find examples of this counter-narrative. And I'm going to go quite quickly through some of the examples because I think it's through these small examples of what's possible that an alternative may be seen. And the strategies that I have identified to look at are resistance, researching, regulation, and reimagining. So resistance is about control. It's about who sets the terms of the agenda, and it's about refusing to cede power to other governments or big companies. It's about asserting civil society. And there are really interesting examples at macro, meso, and micro levels of this kind of resistance. And one of the most interesting was that the Indian government refused to allow Facebook free basics in a country where there is a serious lack of connectivity. That would have been a really difficult decision to make, given the need for access to uh, the internet. And Facebook very cleverly called it internet.org. It would have been really hard in 2016. I think what Facebook's done since then has proved the Indian government right. And there are still places in the world, South Africa where I live, where the government is resisting market capture, where government policies are still insistent on social justice, driving their policies, and on transformation, equity, and redress. So it is still possible, even at a senior level, to resist that kind of market domination and marketization. And even us, as individuals, we can resist Google as the font of all knowledge. You may ask, why? The first question people always say is, why? I don't mind if my, you know, I don't have anything private. Anyone can see what I, I have to say. So it's not just about privacy. If you read the terms of conditions of Google, which I was doing again last night because they reminded me they've recently been updated, you are giving everything to Google, and you have agreed that the alphabet company can cross-pollinate uh, your data. 
you are going to get un super ultra targeted adverts and unless you are extraordinarily disciplined you're going to find yourself clicking on them because every click swipe like etc is captured but the most scary part of all is that aggregation because that aggregation of data concentrates power it's a winner takes all scenario and that's what enables serious serious social damage and we could talk about this for a long time people are going to say but how do you do that and i can only make one or two suggestions in a very short uh, time that i have use alternatives there are alternatives to almost everything if you want to plant a tree every time you search use ecosia it's a search engine that gives all its advertising revenue to plant trees um stop verbing the product stop saying you googled it when you looked something up online and break those super connections it's really hard to get out of every single one of those google products but as soon as you get out of some of them you're breaking the connections and i have provided some urls there for people who'd like to follow this up as a, a possibility and then the other thing i want to mention briefly is there is a lot of critical scholarship which is interrogating this new normal and there are too many people to mention but there's some really important work happening analyzing and exposing what's happening and there's also staff facing work like the camp critical pedagogy and the digital pedagogy lab and some good student facing work like unbounded eq which is a free online course for students so there's some great examples although i do feel obliged to say that it's very difficult to keep doing critical scholarship when higher education itself is turning into a gig economy and it's it, perhaps it's a coincidence that there's a strike in the uk at the moment over this very issue hard to do critical scholarly work when you're actually wondering where the next gig comes from which takes me on to research i would say there's too much opinion too much misinformation and actually not enough research and in an age where anti-intellectualism expressed by a minister in government in 2016 is widespread robust research is needed and needs to be reclaimed and we need solid research based on scholarly expertise we do not need to be ashamed of having scholarly expertise framed by ethics protocols quality controlled by peer review and resourced by impartial funders we have to find what we're going to find and we need all kinds of research and there are some great examples thanks to twitter i managed to crowdsource many more examples that i'm able to share today one of them is the good work that just does with its annual survey on students use of technology we don't know we make claims all the time but year after year tracking what students actually do will give us a long term uh, a long term view and then thanks to the idrc there was a massive research pro project across the gro global south 26 countries and i think it's really important to have these international projects this one was great because it actually provided a voice to the global south which as we know in the online sphere is invisible on the whole So those are the kinds of examples I think there is a lot to be said for. And of course we need more on for the humanities. We hear so much about growing technical skills, learning to code, but the humanities are the ways that we make sense. It's about sense making. We need sociology, we need anthropology, we need to be making sense of this crazy world we're in. And here is my research agenda which once again we could spend a long time talking about the new kinds of things we need to be researching ranging from ethics to coloniality to how inequality is morphing in this new space to alternative imaginaries to the politics and and um, economics and learning theories and machine learning there are so many important areas of research that are needed um did everyone watch this extraordinary exchange between Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Mark Zuckerberg if you didn't I recommend finding it on YouTube she asked him very simply whether he would or wouldn't take down lies from Facebook and he wouldn't answer and I think 
that these kinds of discussions, this was the finance committee, are setting the rules of the game, and those rules are going to percolate into higher education, so they really matter to us. Of course, these happen in a context, and um, the work of, of uh, political economists like Jason Jackson are really good at explaining, in this case, how AI is embedded in particular economic systems. So we can't make generalizations. It's really important not to make generalizations, but once again, I'd recommend this particular talk. And of course, um, regulations. Regulations can ameliorate harm. Chatbots, we've heard about chatbots over the last few days. In California, a chatbot has to be identified as a piece of software, not as a human, I think. When we're talking about pedagogies of care, that's an important regulation. Three US cities have banned the use of facial recognition software. What does that mean for schools? And we also find regulations that enable inclusion. So New Zealand's the only country in the world that has actually regulated and put into its qualifications framework micro-credentials, which are new forms of access and inclusion. I think that's an important step. And um, Ethiopia has now instituted a national open access policy. 45 universities, voices from the global south. And the last thing I just want to make a plea for from the point of view of regulations is Yesterday, we had the ICDE talking about uh, ethics in learning analytics. The, the Australian uh, dis discussion document says, get a move on. Institutions need policies at the institutional level around the use of learning analytics. My final area and my final strategy, interestingly, turned out to be the hardest one and Brian, this should be something you are the most familiar with, but I wanted to look for examples of reimagining a different future. There is so much dystopian reimagining. Where are those positive accounts of redirecting the story? That was really hard to find. Ursula Le Guin, the most wonderful writer, she's called a science fiction writer, but of course she's so much more than that. She talks about imagination and she says it's not about making money. It has no place in the vocabulary of profit making. It's not a weapon, although all weapons originate from it and their use and non-use depends on it. The imagination is an essential tool of the mind, a fundamental way of thinking and an indispensable means of becoming and remaining human. So in this age of automation and artificial intelligence, the imagination is the fundamental way of becoming human. And I found when I was looking for different imaginings how so many people turned to narrative, to the story, to the fundamental story. So uh, drone, the, uh, the book about drones and dreams, there's a wonderful project from Digital Asia, available online. Speculative Data Futures is the Access to Knowledge project, which is based in Cairo. And every year, MIT brings out a, a, a 12 tomorrows looking at the future. And this year, the editor said, no dystopian stories, because all the previous ones have been dystopian stories. We have to start thinking of a different kind of future. I acknowledge our futurist right here when I talk about imagining the future. I think we've all agreed the future cannot be predicted. And this is why we're seeing the rise of future studies, possible, probable, and preferred futures, and also the rise of anticipation studies, which is something I'd only come to um, know about fairly recently, where the premise is that the future is unknowable. So what do you do on that basis? And the last thing I want to mention is the important work I think many people in this room are doing around innovating alternative models. So people tend to be quite rude about MOOCs nowadays. MOOCs are dead, you know, MOOC was everything, now MOOCs are dead. A recent review of MOOCs showed that in fact MOOCs are not dead, that multilingual MOOCs and regional MOOCs are doing a great deal to, in to enhance equity and inclusion in a number of places. So 
those kinds of innovations for alternative futures are not to be ignored. Using Creative Commons licenses, open licenses are providing new kinds of business models. And there are also some business models like the OERU, which are based on a commons-based social innovation premise. I think these kinds of alternative models are really important if we want to create some kind of a different future. And with that, I, I end. You don't need to worry. Um, the, the, um, the link to the slides is at the bottom. And there are some references that, are, that have also been included. So I, I'm, this is really asking people to join me in creating a counter-narrative through whichever mechanism, strategy, or form of engagement works for you. Thank you. Oh, yeah? Thank you so much. So, Oh, great. great. Take a deep breath and absorb those four R's just before you have coffee. Um, so we have a bit of time for questions, um, either to an individual or to the panel. Um, and we hope to start a conversation. So if you can wave at me, please, and we'll run a mic to you. Who'd like to start? Uh, one there. If you could just say your name and where you're from and keep your questions short, please. Okay. Um, Michelle Selinger, uh, independent education technology consultant. Um, it, it was really interesting hearing Brian and Shirley talking because they really are poles apart. Shirley is talking about the future of the institution, how to be more cost effective, and Brian is saying that students can actually learn on their own. And yet Shirley said how important teachers are. But I wonder that we, what we haven't looked at here is, is higher education the future for so many students? We have so many people going into higher education. And we get all sorts of weird and wonderful degrees. And everyone ought to have an opportunity for education. But do we really need to be thinking, rethinking the whole model of education post-school? post-16 or post-18, so that it becomes affordable in ways that give everybody the opportunities they need in order to progress in this world socially and economically. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I'm going to ask for a one-sentence response from each member of the panel. Can you go first, Brian? <clears throat> it would, is higher the education the future was the question, or is there another model? For all. I couldn't hear that last part. Okay. One sentence with a lot of semicolons. Um, that's a really good point. I'm personally worried about uh, declining enrollment in higher education. Uh, that happens in many different nations, including the US. Okay. Shirley? I agree with what Brian said. We're already seeing quite significant changes happening um, in Australia. I don't know if it's worldwide, but enrollments in postgraduate courses has plummeted mm -hmm. and so we're all scrambling now looking at different models of postgraduate education people are wanting something that's more than a sentence sorry but people are wanting much shorter courses um, and so I think the whole model is already changing okay do you want to respond Laura yeah I, I think that what you're speaking about is about a kind of a contestation about the soul of the university at the moment what is the university's purpose Okay, um, one down the front here. Can you say who you are, please? Okay. Hello, I'm Gila Kurtz. I'm from Holon Institute of Technology in Israel. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your uh, interesting uh, presentation. I have a question or kind of wondering. I'm uh, a lecturer on research methods, and you said we need a solid res research. So I'm kind of wondering if we're teaching the right research methods. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was for you. Laura, are we teaching the right research methods? I, th I think that's a very fair question. And I think in the context of what I was saying, I, I was, I was, it was a kind of counter-argument to the notion that we don't need expertise. So I think your question is the next step. It's, it was a plea for, we do need research, we do need evidence, but of course we need to be changing how we do research. Yes. Thank you. 
Thanks. Another question? Uh, my name is Martin Rima, Hamburg University. Um, I think one of the greatest crimes some states permit is making people pay for their education. As a state, they suffer because you don't get many brains who are poorer to work, and you start to set your, your children off with a very bad situation financially. Uh, so there are many things we can change, but one thing we should change, and I'm from Germany, I can say that, is we should change education to be free for everyone. That's a major economic thing I would propose. Okay, so is that a question to a particular person? Um, anyone want to have a go, Brian? Just uh, one quick note to say, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, I come from the United States and I have one small correction. The amount of student debt in the United States is not 1.5 billion. It is $1.5 trillion. Uh, it is larger than any debt in the United States except for housing debt. Um, and what astonishes me is that nobody else is following in our wonderful footsteps in this. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think what you propose is, is fantastic. However, uh, there is a wonderful scholar named Chris Newfield who has researched this field. And he looked into the defunding of public higher education. And he finds that it's based on a cultural shift. Instead of thinking about higher education, or education as a whole, as a public good, as my colleagues have done, we now think about it as a private good. And this is part of the neoliberal economic understanding. And he argues that we need to reconceive this as a public good, in which case, then, we can have public funding. Okay, thank you. Do either of you want to speak? No, I agree. There's a big debate in Australia about education as public or private good. And those who yes. want to cease government funding of education say it's only a private good. Yep. Um, of course, it's a big topic of debate. Okay, any other questions? This one just there. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Ula Abu Amsha from Jesuit Worldwide Learning. I just want to attract your attention to maybe a different model, a proof of concept that is lasting since 10 years now with my NGO where we are offering higher education, pushing boundaries, bringing higher education to people where they cannot access education. They are aspiring from refugee camps, from remote areas, with free education, with very limited resources, using blended learning. So maybe I invite you to discover our model, what we are offering, and helping us to make it more global with your support, because we are, we are working with universities but we have so many challenges to get to, re to offer broader offers. You have everything, but you are lacking students, and we can offer this, but also we need funding for all Thank these. Thank you. Um, can you just repeat an easy way Jesuit about... Jesuit Worldwide Learning. Sorry, the first... We are based in Switzerland, right? but we work in Africa, in Asia, and yeah. soon in Latin America. Okay, if you can... Put it on Twitter, baby, so people have got a link. That would be brilliant. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, anyone else? Question or comment? Thank you. Anyone at the back, wave hard at uh, me. Adam Baylis, uh, currently in Germany. Uh, you made a very interesting point about the age of population. Now, in the future, there won't be so many children pay our pensions. So when we get to 60, we're looking at another 30 productive years. So we're going to need more higher education in, in you know, advanced ages. Um, that's, that's something which seems to be missing from the education policy. OK. Yes. Um, it was mentioned. If I can just get a quick answer from each panel member. What about the ageing population and the change in the balance of demographics? Yeah? Where is the speaker? I can't see you. He's here. Can Hello. you? Oh, hello. Thank you. Uh, I'd love my colleagues to speak first. Yes, I, I agree completely. And I mentioned it a little earlier in response to a question about the change in postgraduate education, that once upon a time people would do an undergraduate degree and then follow up with a postgraduate degree. They don't do that now. Um, they want to come back and do shorter forms of courses. But we've just done some work on who the learners are who are coming in to do mm. this quite different approach to postgraduate. 
and surprising to find a number of people in the general population who are aging and just feeling uh, lonely. And they're, but they've been professionals and they want to be part of a structure, so we're looking at ways of packaging up learning that is useful alongside networking opportunities and other things. So in that way, I think higher education is already changing. And on top of that, we have opportunities for them to be engaged in volunteer work and other things to put back into the community. So I think that whole postgraduate space is probably going to change faster than the undergraduate space. Do you want to respond, Brian? Uh, very, very quickly, if I can connect that with two previous questions. Um, with two stories. In the United States, uh, we had a, a scandal this summer where the University of Minnesota granted uh, senior citizens um, a remarkable fee structure. Uh, they could pay, I believe it was $8 a credit hour uh, to take university courses and get credit for them, including towards a degree, uh, which sounds fantastic, and it's a, it's a great boon for elders. But this blew up as people who were not 65 said, $8 a credit hour? I would love that. Um, and it was seen as intergenerational tension. Flip side of that, in Arizona State University, they just opened a new um, residence hall uh, where you have to be retired in order to live there. It's very, very expensive. I mean, we're talking about million dollar condos. Um, but if you get to retire there, you're in the middle of the downtown of the campus. You can be a docent at a museum. You can go to all classes, hear all speakers. Um, and if you're really concerned about cognitive decline or if you just want to learn, it's a fantastic opportunity. So just to think about this in terms of financial sustainability, on the one hand, we have this kind of public subvention model where the state supports the seniors uh, in being able to learn in their retirement. On the other hand, there's the exact opposite, a hyper-privatized version where the wealthy get to really mm. help support a university and keep it going in their retirement. Uh, these are two different models that uh, are in play. Thank you for that great question. Yeah, thank you. I can probably take one more. Really. Thank it's you. Do you see another one, Brian? Um, hi, I'm Ainara. I'm from Lapster. Uh, we develop virtual simulations for teaching science. Um, my question is more about like data and, and learning analytics. You mentioned, I, I think it was called Review, this uh, new system for grading students, uh, I think is, is amazing, it's really good, but it's the same thing, it's collecting data, and, and it's just the data is collected at the university, but why is that different uh, from Google collecting data? I mean, uh, I know it's different, thanks. but it's, it's a little bit, um, how, how do we decide point. when it's good to collect data to maybe improve the design of a teaching experience or a learning experience? How, how do we handle that? Kind of okay, um, so thank you. I mean, what I've heard is actually, are we just tarring ourselves with the same brush? Um, or uh, are there valid reasons in universities to collect data and use it? Is, is that okay? Anyone want to tackle that? So I'm not sure that I, I heard the question properly, so I'm going to answer the question I think I heard. I have a significant hearing impairment and the acoustics in here is not helping. Um, I think you are asking me about the ethics of collecting data in the ACA writer, the academic writing analytics. So no, no data is collected about an individual student um, uh, in that program. And um, so the students get the feedback in the program. The program doesn't know who they are. Um, and so, so no data is collected at all. The second one I showed was the on task where we are actually using student data. And what was interesting is that when we told the students that we were doing this, the students were really shocked to find out that we knew so much about them, <laughs> which is quite, is quite interesting yeah. um, in terms of their own data literacy. And I think it was quite an education for them to realise how yeah. many footprints they leave behind. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, they, they valued the opportunity to, to get that uh, individual feedback every week about where they were going and what they needed to do. Um, so we have a fairly strong um, 
data analytics ethics statement at my university and we run seminars on the, on the ethics of using data um, in the university and in the community. So it's a, it's a very um, hot issue and something that we're very concerned about because it does, I mean, when do you cross the line to it being surveillance? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I can take a quick comment from both of you, Brian. There's a wonderful line from an editorial in The Lancet that came out last year, which said that we shouldn't think of data as the new oil. Instead, we should think about data as the new blood. I don't mean that in a gothic way. I mean, the idea was that you, know, you think about how much regulation there is around blood, how it's typed, how it's organized, how it's preserved, how it's cared for. And if we think about data that way, I think that's a fantastic metaphor. Okay, Laura. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think your question is exactly the right question to end the session on, and I think that was why I think the question of uh, learning analytics policies for institutions are so incredibly important, and the few examples that I have been able to find, which I, I, I had some, but I had to cut because of time, are really interesting to see how it's being dealt with. Uh, the University of Auckland, for example, says that student data that is used will be done with the student's consent and will always involve a person, a human being, intervening with um, engaging with that data. So it's, it's quite interesting and complex, but I think that is the question as we move into this new era. So thank you for that. Thank you. So thank you very much. So we're going to close. I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about. So there's two things I'm going to ask you to do. Yes. I'm going to ask you to thank the panel, and I'm going to suggest a slightly different way of doing that. Um, and then please have one more conversation with someone around you before you leave um, for coffee. So let's try jazz hands instead of clapping. OK. And you can wave back. You can wiggle the hips as wave, well. Yeah. Wave. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, panel. <laughs>